Welcome to the Flower Lounge, a place for conversations with wildly creative people and a little plant-loving wisdom to help you experience life in full bloom. I'm Katie Hess, flower alchemist and founder of Lotus Way, and I believe in a world where we're all living at our personal edge. Welcome to this week's episode of The Flower Lounge. I'm really excited for this episode. We have with us Laura Hollick, who is an award-winning artist and visionary guide. And after walking 10,000 kilometers on a vision quest, Laura clarified her purpose and dove into realizing it. She's founder of Soul Art Studio Inc., a business devoted to circulating love around the planet with creative inspiration. Bravo TV created a documentary about Laura's art and life called The Artist's Life, Laura Hollick. And Laura hosted and produced over 500 radio shows, holy cow, she is a pro, on 93.3 FM CFMU called The Artist's Lifestyle. And she led a TEDx talk called You Are the Art. Laura's art and insights inspire audiences around the world with her global events like International Soul Art Day, which we are participating in this year. I'm so excited for it. The Global Vision Quest, the Yoni Art Project, the New Icon Movie, and weekly peer inspiration newsletter. Learn more about Laura and be nourished by her peer inspiration at lauraholic.com. So excited to have you, Laura. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. I'm so excited. And I'm so excited that you're participating in International Soul Art Day and the flowers are going to be part of this and the artists that are working in the studio with those flower essences. I cannot wait to see them just light up the way I have as I've been using these flower essences in my work. So So I'm excited to dive in today. Yay. Okay. So we usually start off every episode with a childhood exercise. So just close your eyes and get comfortable and go back to a time in your childhood when you played around flowers, plants, or trees, and just think about who you were with and what you were up to. And see if you can identify a favorite flower or botanical. Hmm. And Shall then, I say it or just visualize it? And we'll then reflect on, as you're visualizing it, the three words you would use to describe its personality. And then whenever you're ready, you can share everything and anything about what you're thinking about. Okay. Well, right away, a word came. It was like one big word and it was just magical. And... I saw myself as a kid and we actually lived around a lot of nature. There were just like, as far as you could see, fields and meadows and forest. And we used to like cross country ski through basically our backyard. And when I was a kid, I would just go and sit out there by myself. So that was a very normal thing. And I'd be surrounded by daisies and kind of whatever was natural trilliums in Canada, the Ontario flower is the trillium. And I actually had a really funny story. Oh my gosh. Well, it's actually illegal to pick them, but I was a kid and I didn't know that. So I was, I saw them, they were coming up. So they're kind of white with some had a little pink in them. I gathered the biggest bouquet, you could ever imagine, like both arms holding this, come home, mom, look what I found. And my mom was like, get in the house, get in the house. Cause like, <laughs> <laughs> but they were so beautiful and they would just sprout up. And so, yeah, the word that came was magical. And I guess I would add to that a feeling of home like where I get to go into my imagination and and just be supported by nature and I guess naturalness yeah Mm. magical natural and home Mm, I love that so the way so what we find is that the way you describe your childhood favorite would generally describe the way that you bring your gifts into the world so magical Hmm, that makes me just wonder about the whole illegal picking (laughs) well first let's see let's see (laughs) well first there's magical you bring people home imaginative supported by nature and naturalness illegal that's like you know what i would add to it innocence Innocent. Because, you know, I picked those flowers because I'm like, oh, I wanted to show my mom. They felt so happy, so beautiful. And I wanted to share that. And I and I am like that today. It's like just there's an innocence to the desire of sharing beauty. And you didn't know that they were illegal. 
I didn't know that, but then I, I learned that and I never picked them again because I was like a good girl, right? I learned, <laughs> but I admired them. Mm -hmm. They're so beautiful. I, for some years of my life, I grew up in the upper peninsula of Michigan and I remember they just look like, like somebody dropped popcorn all over the forest floor. Yes, it's true. Because they're also kind of scattered out. They, they're they in, they're not all bunched together. Like you might see a few sprouting up around each other, but each one has its own space. Yeah. And they seem to just kind of come up all throughout the forest. I don't know, even know how they got there. Like someone, I don't know, like it, how does their seed spread? Because it seems kind of random. So it is like popcorn. It's just <laughs> all over the floor of the forest and <laughs> and it's just for a certain time of the year and then then you don't see them again. So mm -hmm. that's the, the flower of Ontario, which is where I'm from. And yeah, it's such a it, and it's got like these very simple petals to them. It's it's a very simple flower. So do you feel like nature informed when you were a kid? you're like blossoming into an artist or does it inform your work now? Mm -hmm. So when I was a kid, I felt very out of place and I felt like I didn't know how to connect with people. And so for me, I spent a lot of time in nature imagining and nature supported me to imagine because I would see like the trilliums and then I would imagine myself kind of, you know, galloping on a unicorn through these areas, you know, <laughs> my opened. And then as I started to grow up, I realized I could make my imagination real. And that's how I became an artist is really making my imagination real. And at the root of that, it's being able to create a home for myself, a place where I am comfortable, a place that I'm you know, I feel cherished and wanted and celebrated and, and I can connect and it's relaxing. So art for me, nature supported me to open to it, but it was really the art became a way to just make this feeling of home more tangible to me. Mm, I love that. How do you, I, how do you help other people find that because mm -hmm. I think it's actually a really common thing. There's sort of a bit of a, a soul homelessness in a way. And what I mean by that is like we, we all have our side of us, so it's not like it's lost. But depending on when you're born into the world and what part of the world, in our culture, a lot of the things in, in society don't really match the way that the soul perceives you know, like we have kind of a hierarchical structured society and it's based on money in a lot of cases. And the soul doesn't really think that way. And so things can be very confusing. Even if you look at a person, I think the soul doesn't perceive it necessarily as masculine or feminine or age or gender or race. The soul is just like, oh, you're another being. <laughs> kind of like the flowers, like you're another being. But then you learn, it's like, oh, there are differences, but it's almost like it has to be taught. And all those things to me created a feeling of homelessness because I'm like, this isn't who I am doesn't operate in these ways. And I had to kind of figure out how to operate in the world. So when I'm working with other people, you know, that might not be the case for everyone, but I think there's a degree of the soul wants to be more integrated into our life. And so I'm always seeking to find ways to support people to know how to connect with their soul, listen to it, take action on it, decode the messages that it's giving, uh, express it, build the trust in it, so that they just, they can have their home here, they can be who they are here. So I think there's an element of that for everyone. And if there isn't, there's also the level of the soul always wants to grow and expand. So when I'm working with people, it's just connecting with who they really are and being like, well, what is it you need at this time? What's your next flowering? Like, what's your next level of unfolding that you're called to explore or heal or transform? And then I work with people there, like where that edge is for them, that's where I will meet them and, and we will create something together that supports their opening. Wow. I love that. Like a flower. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. You know, and, and people are like flowers, really. Like we are, like the soul is like a flower. And there was this beautiful quote by this woman, Natalia Rose. <laughs> yeah, Rose, interesting. So she wrote, a, she does a lot of work on nutrition. And, and I've studied with her and she was convinced of this idea that our cells are timeless. And so she did all this nutritional work to support that, you know, to, but then she was always stumped by this idea that if you look at a flower, it dies. So how can it be timeless? And she was so stumped by this for years. And she was like watching the flowers in the garden. She's like, oh, if we're like a flower, then we die. And so we will age. And we, and she was like really getting disheartened by this reality. And then she realized, she's like, no, actually we are the garden you know, and the garden is timeless. So it's like the soul is the garden. And so yes, we will continuously flower things up and they will rise and they will fall, but the garden remains. The garden can always support. It always has the fertility of flowering, even though one, one of those buds will die. And, you know, just like in our life, we'll have an experience, it ends, but we'll have more. There's another flowering to come because we're the garden. That reminds me of something that one of my spiritual teachers told me recently, actually, and he was saying that, he was saying, <clears throat> you come up to this incredibly beautiful, exquisite garden, and then we fall into this trap of not really appreciating the whole entire garden. We like zoom in on one flower and we get super fixated by how beautiful that one flower is without, you know, forgetting to see the whole garden. It's a little bit of a different metaphor, but I love the idea of that vast, the vast part of us actually being the garden. Mm -hmm. And it can support the life and the death, meaning it's like, there are times in our life where we are that beautiful fullness of the, you know, the petals have opened and it's super fresh. And then also they will come down. But it's mm -hmm. not like, that's the end. It's like another one's going to come up because <laughs> the garden itself can support many expressions, many unfoldings. And I think that in our culture, we think of ourselves in terms of age, and there's one point of flowering that's kind of like, you know, 22 to whatever, the Victoria's Secret kind of look, right? Oh <laughs> this is sort of this idea, oh God, right? This, <laughs> it's crazy, right? But in, in the culture, that that's, and it's, it's not true. You know, like someone who is one years old, let's say, mm -hmm. could have flowering of an experience and then that experience ends and then at two years old they have another one and at 50 and at 99 there's another one so it's where the garden is not just one thing that's of an age it's like experiences that we allow within ourselves, a ripening and then an integration and then kind of like a coming down to rest for the next ripening and integration yeah and what have been some of the major experiences in life that have ripened you <laughs> There's so many, you know, I always think of them like initiations. Mm -hmm. And I think the one in childhood was a huge one where I felt so disconnected and so homeless. And then that journey of discovering that art could enable me to make my home for myself, like I could create things and that could create a home for me. So that was a ripening, sort of healing the wound of disconnection. And then when I was in high school, I had acne. And this was like a her, totally horrific experience for me, you know, because I just felt like I had to hide. And it was almost like another layer of the homelessness where, you know, it felt, I felt like I couldn't be seen or I didn't want to be seen. And that ripened into a lot of the work I do now where I am my art. You know, I'm so visible. I, in all the things I create, it's, I'm pretty much in all of the images. And so that was a ripening of me learning how to see myself and accept and, and love my body and my skin and my face. And so that felt like a ripening. And then after that process, then it went into kind of the phase of figuring out my career and feeling so lost. I'm getting a theme here. Before every ripening, I'm a little <laughs> bit lost. <laughs> Seriously lost. And yeah, when I was trying to figure out my career, I had no idea how to make money. And I, again, felt so disconnected from society. All these people, I'm like, how do you buy cheese? Like I look in the grocery store and it's so expensive. I'm like, who are these people buying this cheese? <laughs> and I'm like, how do they do it? 
I was on such a journey with that to figure out how to integrate into society, being myself. And that became a ripening and, and with my business and I did that vision quest and I walked for over five years really as a meditation to figure that out. And then it ripened into my business. And I feel like now there's like another thing where I had felt kind of lost with that kind of like compost for the soil in a way, like these sort of uncomfortable energies, feeling lost, feeling angry, feeling grief, feeling sadness, depression types of energies, they become compost. And now I feel like my kind of frustrations or irritations are on just getting the work that I have to the level it wants to go to. Like that's the thing that I can feel that the roots are going down and the sort of pressing up through the ground to try and, and live in that new way of just reaching the level of people and the depth of people like the depth of their soul, like connecting with someone that they would remember that experience for decades to come because it met them on such a deep place. That's where I'm now, I'm massaging that mm -hmm. ripening. Wait, yeah. something you said was really interesting. Let's rewind a little bit. When you talked about walking for five years, do you want to tell us more about that? Mm -hmm. So in that phase where I didn't know how to make money, I, and I had a studio, like I went to university for fine arts and I graduated from that in the honors program and it was really celebrated for my art. And I thought, of course, I'll just go be an artist. Like it, it never, I never thought anything different. But then within a few months of being out there, I'm like, oh my God, I have no idea how to make money. Like just making <laughs> your art not having money come piling up at your door. <laughs> and I was confused. I was shocked. Yeah. Like literally my system was like, what a betrayal. You know, you build these gifts and talents and skills and you do it, but then you can't even buy food type of thing. And I was totally living that stereotype of the starving artist and very unhappy about it. And I used to, my studio that I had was out in the woods and I'd have to walk 45 minutes just to get there. And so every day, and I loved it, I'd go for a hike through the forest to get to the studio. And on my walks, I was like praying, tell me what to do. I have no idea what to, I'll do what you need me to do, like divine universe. I, I don't know how to make money. Teach me how to make money. Show me what I need to do. And the messages I kept getting were walk it out. Like it was so clear. And I'd ask the same question day after day. And it said, walk it out. And I finally, I was like, I am walking. I was in the forest <laughs> and I was like calling out to the trees. Can you, I am walking. <laughs> And then it was a light bulb moment. And I thought, you know what? I could get paid to walk. And then I applied for a job at Canada Post to deliver the mail. And I ended up getting this job. But when I got the job, you kind of get into this list where whatever spots they have to fill, they put you in that. And I had applied for the job as a letter carrier, but they didn't have any spaces in that. So they, they call me up one day and they're like, oh, we have an opening and it's in transportation. Okay. And I was like, oh, what, what does that mean? They're like, oh, you're going to be a truck driver. And I was like, oh no, I'm a letter carrier. I, I want to be a letter carrier. And they said, oh, well, we don't have any spots. And if you don't accept this, you're off the list. Ah. And I was like, well, how long would I have to be a truck driver? And they're like, well, until another spot opens up. And I was like, okay. So I ended up going to get three different truck driving licenses. <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> and I was a truck driver and I cried and screamed every day for wow. a year. Wow. And at the end of that year, a spot opened up and I became a letter carrier. And then I was able to kind of begin this, you know, message I got of walk it out. And I made a deal with the universe. I said, I will walk 10,000 kilometers. And what I want in exchange for that <laughs> is wow. I will how to make money doing my art. Show me how I can like follow my heart and make money. And so I started walking and I walked like, you know, four to six hours a day on weekdays for over five years. Wow. And then I completed the 10,000 kilometers. And to the week that I completed it, I moved into the studio where I am now, which is this gorgeous place. And that was over 12 years ago. Wow. And at that time I was, I was ready. Like, it's like I had the truck driving had kind of released about a thousand primal screams <laughs> in me and really opened up a very deep place 
inside of me. And then when I started walking, it was clearing limiting beliefs. It was like ripening the vision. Like, well, what do I actually want? And every day was my meditation. And some of them were brutal because like you have ice pellets coming in your face and or it's like downpour rain and you're just out there just being like, oh my God, or it's snowed and no one shovels their driveway <laughs> and you're like plowing through the snow or it's super hot. Like it was kind of brutal it's such a physical job it seems romantic like oh you're out there walking every day but it's actually physically very demanding and I just prepared myself internally to learn about money and learn about business and that's what I did when I finished it I just dove in and I started learning about business and I connected with a bunch of kind of millionaire multi-millionaire type of people and studied with them and learned from them and learned really quickly that I thought differently than them. I had some similarities, like the entrepreneur mind and the artist mind are very similar. It's the person who can enter the unknown and create something that doesn't exist and trust it even when there's no proof. Right. And I had that really, like I could do that. So entrepreneurs are like that. And any millionaire that I have met, they are like that. They are people that will do things. They don't have proof. They believe in themselves. They trust their inner guidance and they go for it. Right. And they, they learn from their mistakes. They're not afraid of the full range of the garden, you know, the flowering and the coming down. Like they kind of get that they're the garden. They're not just one little sprout. They're right. like the whole, the whole fertile thing. Mm-hmm. So it was that. really, um, yeah, it's a, that's my 10,000 kilometer vision quest. I love that you, it is such a profound mentality. And so like rare and far and few between is this mentality that you would do something for so long that could be so uncomfortable and you would dedicate that to like your own purification, ripening, clarification. I mean, it's just so old school. It's so beautiful. (laughs) You know, in a world where like it's so we just like want things now and we we can just like google anything and we can take Mm -hmm. a weekend workshop and become an expert in something Mm -hmm. it's like that old school mentality has escaped us I think culturally and I just think that's so sweet and so precious that you Mm -hmm. took so much time to something that was uncomfortable and like fiercely devoted it to your own growth and it sounds like it really worked it did work. I don't think I was seeing it totally like I now I look back and I almost feel like I want to cry thinking I'm like, yeah, like, wow, I really did devote, I gave a lot to that. Mm-hmm. And yet when I was in it, I really, I really felt a little bit tortured. And I but I was committed, like I had made a, a, this, I even wrote a contract, like I had it printed on beautiful paper, and I signed it and I put a symbol that represented that the universe had signed it. Wow. And I had that and I documented my kilometers every day, you know, even wow. on the weekends, I would still go for walks. So it's like, it kept me believing it, but it was it was hard, because around and with my family and the people around me, I I watched my friends from high school and university go off and make money and they're buying houses and they're, they're buying cars and they're, they're buying food and they're doing things and they're, you know, and, and I was like, man, I'm like wearing steel toed boots and I'm like going out this outfit that is like not me at all. (laughs) But it was, it was confusing, but it stripped me. It was so humbling. It kind of, you know, if I was ever thinking I sat on any kind of a pedestal, it just knocked me off. And it stripped me of thinking that when you see a person that you re- you know anything about them. Because if you see, say, a cab driver or someone at the checkout line, that person literally could be a total genius. Right. They could be a total genius. They could have uh, shared love with someone. They could have helped someone. They could have done something really beautiful. And you just see them as they're, they're in this, you know, they're driving a cab or the, and I learned that I'm like, wow, cause I knew I had so much inside of me and people would see me like, oh, she's just a uniform doing this job. But mm-hmm. I'm like, no, I'm doing soul work here. So it, it stripped me of looking at people and judging them by what they look like. And, and, going deeper into seeing someone's soul because I had to do that for my own sanity. I'm like, I am not just doing this job. I'm not just wearing this uniform. Like this, this matters. It's hard and kind of sucks, (laughs) but 
for whatever reason, this is what I was guided to do and I'll do it. And I think the universe and our relationship got stronger because I, I learned how I could trust myself. I can follow through. I'll do what I say I will do. I will, you know, if I get a message, I'll act on it if it makes no sense at all, even to me. That's huge. Right? Uh, yeah. So, but it was tough. And, and I, and I think in our culture now, like you said, things are so fast and we kind of expect, you know, to have say like a million Instagram followers or, you know, all of a sudden you're making a million dollars. Meanwhile, the person doesn't even know what their art is yet. <laughs> it's like, I'm like, okay, so we, there's a little bit of naturalness that does need to be returned, which is things do take time. Like we're a timeless soul and meaning there's kind of no time. But in this reality, it does take time. A flower takes time to ripen, which is why organic food is so important. If we're pumping lemons to ripen before they're really ready, you know, that's what our culture is eating. We're, we're eating, in many cases, foods that were pushed to be ready before their naturalness. And so, um, which is why I eat organic as best I can, because I, I want to be natural. I want to... I want to know what is real for me. And yeah. so it's, it reminds me of this when I was interviewing KP Carlson, he was talking about a particular herb and he was saying, Oh yeah, this herb, this herb had an overnight success. It was a 48 year overnight success. You know, like, <laughs> like that <laughs> idea of like things really, really take time. And it reminds mm -hmm. me actually what you did reminds me a little bit of, um, so some of my past training in Tibetan Buddhism is is there there's this practice called nundro where you when you're a beginner you commit to doing a hundred thousand of at least four different types of practices and the first one that you start is very physical you're doing prostrations and you're literally like putting yourself on the on the ground and the you know very humbling the idea is that you are through these visualizations and chanting and movements that you're um, purifying your body karma purifying your speech karma purifying your mind karma and all mm -hmm. kinds of things come up and hardships and you mm -hmm. all the like crazy things you did and the things you regret and you just end up like in a crumple sometimes in tears on the floor totally and it or on the block in my case <laughs> yeah and it's, it's like it's it's like what you did was so symbolic in us in that same way of you wrote down every day you took it seriously you wrote down every day how many kilometers mm -hmm. and you like you said the the fact that you can trust yourself to follow through on your commitments is really huge it's really meaningful mm -hmm. yeah I you know now that it's that feels almost like another lifetime I look back because it's literally over a decade ago mm -hmm. um but it is a foundational thing and I think in all of our lives we have things that they seem like they're not a big deal, but they actually are building a quality in us that we need to go forward to the thing that we're here to express or do. And that quality of I can trust myself to follow through is something that, you know, you don't go and take a course on that. It's like you live it. And, and I, it just makes me think in all of our lives, you know, and when people look back at the things that they did, maybe a job they didn't like or a relationship that didn't end well, there would still be some quality in it that you received, a nutrient, you know, something to add to the soil of the garden right? for the next thing, the next creation. And you said something a few minutes back about healing the wounds of disconnection. And I think disconnection is something that all of us feel as human beings at one point in our lives or another. And especially as, you know, <laughs> social media and our devices and digital world takes over, there's a lot more disconnectedness in the world. And so if you were going to say, like, you know, from your life experience and practice, a piece of advice to the listeners in terms of how to heal our wounds of disconnection through art mm -hmm. or through any of the practices that you've found to be effective, how would you respond to that? Mm -hmm. So I think it's something that I continue to move through because there's many layers to it. And I think that with each layer that I've moved through with it, because it's sort of the theme in all of my issues that I've gone through is like feeling disconnected. With each one, 
I initially had to deepen into knowing myself. So we can know ourselves, say, as a child, but then all of a sudden you're a teenager. And do you know yourself as a teenager? What are your values now with your new mind and, and then as an adult? And so the knowing ourselves, like turning the gaze inward, creates the root system to support when we are going to connect outwardly. So when people think of connection, they often think of, oh, they're going to go out in the world and connect with another person or be connected. But what supports that? Because you could connect with people and feel the most alone that you've ever felt. Right. I've been in groups of people and there's lots of people around. So it looks like I'm connected or I even could be in a photo on Facebook and there's I mean, you know, a photo with people, right. but it doesn't mean feel connected. And so the thing that actually supports the experience, which is invisible, like you'll, you're you the only one who will know right. <laughs> if you right. actually feel connected, right. right? Because you could literally be surrounded by people and it, everyone else would say, wow, you're so connected. You know so many people, you hang out with so many people. But that it's an invisible feeling of, do you feel connected? So it starts internally, turning the gaze inward and being able to show up for yourself. And one of the things I learned like with my skin when I had acne was like I was so scared of people looking at me. And so then I developed a practice of looking at myself and getting comfortable and being kind to myself and finding things I liked and taking pictures of myself and, and looking and, and moving through the fears of the looking and the judgments and everything, you know, and so it started with me. So then once I felt a certain level of ease, then it was okay for people to look at me. Mm -hmm. And something a lot of people will say to me now with my photos and images where I'm in the picture, they will say to me, oh, it's so easy to look at you or like look into your picture, like go into it like a portal. And that's because I can do that for myself. So then I can make a connection with other people through my art because I actually can embody, it's okay to look. Ooh. I can see my, okay. Ooh, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I had a conversation, I was in New Mexico and there was a bunch of us sitting around the table and this really funny conversation arose, I'm not even sure how it arose, about how we all have this sort of idea of like, this is my best side, or this is my best angle, or, <laughs> you know, you'll see like you're about to take a picture and somebody like will shift their head ever yes. so slightly. So you get that right angle. And there was a gen there was another guy at the table who was saying like, oh yeah, it's definitely this side. Like when I'm walking with a girl, I make sure she's on that side, <laughs> you know, and then you look at the sides and other people are like, I don't see it. I don't, I mean, yeah, like the two sides of your face are never perfectly symmetrical, but like, I don't see what you're saying. And sometimes I drive the girls here crazy because I'm like, okay, this is my feminine side and this is my masculine side. This is the guy right here. And they're like, what are you talking about? You're so ridiculous. But we all have these weird little things, right? So mm -hmm. what would you recommend for, for people to practice being comfortable with every angle, every side, every inch of themselves. Yeah. So I'm laughing because I think, well, I can relate to that. And I think everybody, <laughs> and also being someone who has literally been in thousands of photos, like I have done thousands of photo shoots with many different photographers and myself too. Like I've done my own photo shoots and I, so, and then my, I'll see my face on a screen, like we'll be, you know, working on that picture and and I'm like, oh my God, my one eye kind of closes and oh my God, and there's this. And I started doing face yoga to, <laughs> to work on this. So all I'm saying is I understand. And I think that especially when if, <laughs> and I'm not like a model for other people's products, but I am a model in terms of I'm the one transmitting in an image that I'm creating. So it is actually a skill of mine to know my face and know my angles and know how the light hits my face for the different cheekbone effect and, and all. So it's kind of like there's a skill to it, but on the deep, and so I think all of us, especially with social media, it is beneficial to kind of know what your face does. Now there's another, <laughs> when, what I think you're speaking to, which is like, how do you just love yourself? And like, even if you don't get the angle or, you know, it doesn't have to be this whole stiff experience, how can you just really love yourself? And and I think that that is about being able to look at your ugly and, and find peace in it. And one of the exercises that I have done and I continue to do it, and I've done it with my students if I'm doing like a photo shoot kind of workshop, like an iconic essence expression photo shoot with them, 
we will do an ugly process. And that is because most people are trying, they're getting very stiff trying to just show one aspect. Right. And do a process where it's like, what would you want no one to ever see? Like, what is the thing that you are trying so hard to hide and you want no one to see it? Oh my God, if they see from this angle, it's like game over, blackmail material. It's the worst of the worst. <laughs> and then we do Scary. photos of <laughs> we do photos of that. Wow. I mean, I have done photos where I will squeeze my thighs and my bum so I can get the cellulite to really like pucker up. And I will take a photo <laughs> of that. Have a look. <laughs> <laughs> like a new, have a new look. hashtag cellular pucker <laughs> <laughs> I'll have a look and you know it doesn't mean that that's going to be the image I will release as my art but right. the process of loosening up so you don't have any barriers to yourself it's like mm -hmm. it's okay if you can find your peace with your ugly then your beauty gets more beautiful but also <laughs> and it's more beautiful because you have no resistance right. you're not guarding and, and so kind of letting the guard down, which is a healing process. Most people have, their guard is so militant. Like, I mean, like a person could, you could wake them up in the middle of the night, half asleep, and you go to take a photo of them, they're like, wait a second. <laughs> it's that militant. And so if that guard can be and in safety and love, I mean, imagine the beauty that can come out. So it is a process. I continue to do it. I also do have the skill of studying my face and knowing my face, knowing the muscles in my face. So if I want to express something, I can achieve it, but also that I'm not scared of myself. And oh. I do have one eye that kind of closed. I was, um, I was attacked by a dog when I was a kid and my eye almost fell out. The, oh the doctor said if that dog was gnawing on my face any longer, my oh. eye would have out. I know. So one of my eyes kind of closes and I have a scar around it. And so I have to... Every time I do a photo shoot, it is an issue because that one eye, if, if I'm tired, it will kind of close. Mm -hmm. So I have to be very, and so that's why I do face yoga to work the muscles to strengthen that eye. So you there's know, things to I do. I love to that though. There's something about that. I, I find that actually most people have that, right? Like, yeah. or at least half of the population has one eye that closes more than the other one. Yeah. I don't know. I just and find I that so like compelling. It is compelling in the way of like, you know, if you think of masculine and feminine sides and right and left side of the brain and, you know, what memories are restoring in these tissues that is like doesn't really want to look, you know, because if it's closing a little bit, you know, and, and I've actually seen photos of my face and I will literally crop it in half and I literally look like two different people. Like one eye is very bright and almost like uh, in that side of my face, very bright and lifted, almost like a, an innocent child. Mm -hmm. And then the other the eye kind of closes it's almost like this elder you know mm. this sort of old old wise elder and and they happen to be like in the same face but <laughs> so it is sort of compelling um but I I'm aware of it and I I can use it if I want sure, to sure. but also if I'm grasping something I you know I might make sure that I have my eyes closed while I'm getting my makeup done so I don't waste my muscle on wow. it being open for an hour of makeup when I could use that open time for the photo shoot. So there's little tricks, right. but most people are dealing with that. Most people aren't doing the kind of art photos that I'm doing. They're just looking at selfies and just their everyday life. And I think it's just learning how to, to get used to that you're a whole person, you have beauty, and you have ugly. You know, just like the flower will die and it will rise. You're the garden. You have all of these things and everybody does. Our society wants everyone to just be beautiful and just be in the ripening, but we actually are all of those things. But I think and so when we include it, yeah. When you talk about ugly, like I totally understand what you're saying because it's what we perceive as ugly, right? Yeah, that's true. And, and, and there is something so freaking beautiful about exactly what you were talking about. Someone who has no resistance, who's not guarding, who's fully full bloom themselves, just comfortable in themselves. That makes it so yeah. beautiful. Like I remember the first time I took a train into, into Spain and I ended up living there for a year. And I remember uh, that was a long time ago. I don't know if things have changed, but I remember looking at people's teeth and I was like, oh, wow, they don't do braces here. And I was like, <laughs> that is so freaking beautiful. Like there was something about crooked teeth that just like 
oh my God, it was so compelling and so interesting and so gorgeous that like makes this, all the straight teeth smile, you know, kind of boring actually. And mm. I don't know, that's like kind of changed the way that I saw beauty, you know, mm-hmm. and I, I, I had, um, I noticed that people there were like fully embraced how they were and they didn't take offense to certain things. Like if I had a friend who was super, super duper short, like almost midget status, like very, very, very short, you know, people might call him shorty or tall guy or like, the op, you know, and it was just like people fully embraced themselves as they were. And it was like unbelievably sexy and beautiful. And I remember mm-hmm. thinking, why is it here that like, you know, I feel like there's a, like a ratio of like beautiful, ugly, you know, in the U.S. is so different. I felt like 95% of the people I was just seeing on the street and the trains everywhere in Spain was just like drop dead gorgeous. And like 5% were like average. And I felt like the ratio was totally different in the U.S. But when I reflect on it now and talking to you, it probably just had a lot more to do with less resistance, less guarding, and more just like radiance of being fully in yourself yeah because really what is beauty but someone's soul transmitting through them right and I think that something that we might call ugly according to the societal standards if someone's soul transmits through it it becomes beautiful and there there are actually categories of people in our society they call like the what is it like the sexy ugly like you know like the Mick Jaggers type where it's like (laughs) they don't have a, a traditional beauty but they've got their soul transmits and they're captivating, they're stunning, they're striking, they're intriguing. Right. That's right. a type of a yeah, you know, and, and it's a really good point, the idea of how our another thing where I, I think part of that homelessness feeling that I had, the disconnection where our society does label things and it's almost like you do need to fit into a certain box to be accepted. And it that hurts our soul because just like there's so many different kinds of flowers. There's so many different soul expressions. And imagine if you're like, you know, a lily in t- inside, your soul is a lily, but everyone's saying, oh, the only kind of beauty is a daisy. Mm-hmm. Then you've got a gorgeous lily who's like trying to stuff itself into like a, a suit. <laughs> <laughs> and it just hurts, you know, and right. that goes back to why we feel disconnected. You know, we don't accept ourselves, So we can't even be with people because it hurts to be with them. So on that note of seeing people being who they are, there was this woman who I had such a blessing to spend some time with her. And it was, we ended up having to share a room. We were on this island and, you know, it was just, there were so many cabins. And so I I hadn't met her before, but I knew I was sharing a room with her and I sleep naked. And I'm like, man, how's this going to work if I'm sharing a room with someone? I brought these pajamas, but I'm like, man, it's going to, I'm going to be all twisted up in the sheets. (laughs) Anyway, (laughs) I get to the room and there's this, this woman and she answers the door and I say, hi, I'm Laura and I'm your roommate. She goes, oh, great. Come on in. I've been looking forward to meeting you. She goes, I have to ask you, how do you feel about new? nudity. And I was like, oh, well, I'm fine with it. Actually, you know, I sleep naked. And I I started going to this thing. She goes, oh, that's great. And then she just takes her clothes off and she's walking around. I was like, wow, like she's really comfortable. (laughs) And then I know. And then she pulls out her laptop and it's on the bed and she's like leaning over and didn't suck in her stomach. And okay, this, I'm sure probably every woman would know what I'm talking about. You know, if someone's like going to see you and you're bending, you're aware of yourself from the outside in. Your little jelly rolls bunch up. (laughs) This woman was so in her body, she was feeling relaxation. That was guiding her positioning. It wasn't me looking at her. And I took that in. It was like, and I've never forgotten. I was like, wow, she is completely at ease with her body. I don't think I had ever seen that before, really ever seen it. And what a gift. I... I'm like, wow, we don't have examples of that where someone is totally at ease with their body, even if it doesn't look like the societal ideal, you know, and she had, you know, like she was beautiful already, but when she bent over, there were roles. Mm -hmm. There wasn't even like in my my eyes can pick up a million things at once. There wasn't even a twitch of adjustment. Mm -hmm. So impressed. Yeah, so that's like doing exercises of of how do we build safety in ourselves to let our guard down. Man, you know, when, that- you, when you think about that, it's like, how often is that present? 
in our field of awareness? Like how often, you know, you're wearing your swimming suit at the whatever, the beach or Mm -hmm. like how often are we self-aware in in that way that's not necessarily beneficial? (laughs) I think a ton. I, it's a daily um, practice for me to to come from the inside out and have the feeling of ease be more important than the perception of someone else. It's a daily practice. And I don't think I, I haven't mastered that. I mean, I work on it, but I, I don't feel that's fully ripened in me. And, and I think that's why I'm so conscious of it. And, you know, and, and it's, and it's, you know, the next layer of the journey. It's fun right. to, to play with that. Yeah. But in our society, it's tough because everything is kind of from the outside in. Right. What does it look like? What's your next selfie? Who are you with? Uh, what are the numbers? How many likes are on it? It's all like from the outside in. Right. And so it's easy to say, oh, well, I could be uncomfortable, but at least it'll look good. And, you know, is that really helping? I don't know. I, I don't think it is, but it's hard to, it's hard to own <laughs> the, own it all the time. Mm-hmm. Own the comfort in yourself, even doesn't matter what it looks like. It's, yeah, it's a practice. I love seeing examples of it on social media, though. Like, I love the Gary Vaynerchuk. He'll just like, you know, he'll <laughs> shoot a selfie of himself on the plane after a 24 hour flight, bags under mm. his eyes, making a funny expression, just like, and he is just so like, this is me. And there's just something that's so attractive about that. Um, mm. it's, but it's rare, right? It's rare to see mm-hmm. examples like that. And you were talking about um, living from the inside out. And I know mm-hmm. that you've been experimenting with flower essences and flower essences in your personal life, in your work, in your art. And I wondered if you could share a little bit about why that's important to you. Mm-hmm. Well, I made a decision this year that, you know, each year I work with some kind of a mentor or a guide. And, you know, for most of my life, it's been my higher self. And then as I dove into business, I had business mentors, people who were like millionaires and very successful and on that level in business. And this year, I I asked, I'm like, who is my mentor this year? Who Who do I want to learn from this year? And it came very clear that it was flowers. That's so amazing. And so I know. So I have been daily connecting with flowers and I've got your deck, the beautiful flower oracle card deck that you have. Mm-hmm. And I pull those each day. And then I also have different essences that I eat. And then I also have ones that I weave into my art, kind of depending on what I'm wanting to create. So I sort of tune in. I'm like, what what do I want to work on? And then I'll connect with a flower that resonates to that desire and then let it help me, you know? And I just like, I open myself to that. And it's been so beautiful. Just on one, one simple note, there was, I was taking the trumpet vine, which is Mm -hmm. about fearless speak or like being able to speak, express yourself with your right. voice. Right. And I was taking it and I was like, this is great. And I was getting ready to shoot a bunch of videos, which is why I started to take it. Uh-huh. But what ended up happening, there was this big controversy with one of my art images that kind of just came out of nowhere. It was a picture of me with my menstrual blood showing through my white outfit. <laughs> and it, it was like a huge, it just was like, it kind of blew up. And, and I was like, oh my gosh. And I realized I had to do a Facebook live to talk about it. Wow. And I had, wait, 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 clear, yeah. wait, wait, what was the blow up? Were people upset? They didn't like it. They thought it was crazy. Like what was the big deal? Well, interestingly, everyone, there were so many different points of anger, like anger, rage, raw, primal rage. And it ranged from people thinking it was disgusting, which, okay, fine, I could get that. But then it, it was about it being very racist and that I was like a white, what? you know, using my white, I know, I never what? understood it. That makes no which sense. Is, totally. Everybody and I me. even reached out, I reached out to some like women of color, I reached out to Native people, I reached out to people, I'm like, is this racist? Like, I, I really didn't know. I didn't think so. Anyways, no one who would <laughs> the conversation, like I'd ask some people, they so actually ridiculous. wanted to charge me. Yeah, so they wanted to charge me for a conversation to tell them, to, for them to tell me why I was racist. What? And I did I, I well, it's just, I'm so naive living in my little world here. Like that just seems. I know. Well, like I was naive too. 
Yeah, and so the trumpet vine flower, I didn't realize it, but it it sort of orchestrated an opportunity for me to use my voice. Wow. And I did a Facebook Live and I spoke beautifully. I was even, I watched it after myself. I'm like, how did that go? Like, it felt okay, but how was it? And I watched it and I was like, I was really proud of myself. My voice came through with clarity and bravery and, you know, integrity and respect for myself and other people and a, a space for allowing. Like, I, I felt like the flower helped me in that, having the courage to own my truth, even when there were others that didn't agree with it and be able to speak to it. So that was like a surprise that I, I wow. didn't anticipate that. I took the trumpet vine thinking, I've got to shoot some videos <laughs> and I hope my voice comes out clear. Wow, <laughs> but it Good turned timing. into something bigger. Yeah. <laughs> <Holy cow. laughs> so that's just one example. But I feel like they kind of surprise you. Like when you're working with the flowers, you'll take them for some desired effect, but then something will happen in your life and you'll have responded in a different way. Right. And you can, you can trace it back to, wow, it's like that, that's the energy of that flower that kind of gave me a different pathway to respond to this or to be with this. So I feel like it's kind of, it's, I get surprised and it's mm -hmm. subtle. But when you reflect on it, it's so obvious. Right. The right. connection is so obvious. But in the moment, you're, you're not thinking of it like that. But then I, I can look back and like, oh, wow, yes, I, I was, you know, playing with this flower. And then these things happened. And I was able to handle it in a new way. So it's so powerful. I, I'm loving playing with them and learning about them and really going deeper into my understanding of nature. You know, nature is a being right. and it's not something that we're just kind of walking on, you know, it's like we, it's a <laughs> being that has communication right. and, and I'm so, I feel so lucky that I get the chance to explore that, right. you know, and, and through your work, Katie, because I didn't, I, I'd heard of the Bach flower essences, but I'd never done it. And it was through your work and kind of the way you had presented it and made it accessible mm -hmm. and make it kind of make sense on the level that my body could receive it. And it was so beautifully laid out. I'm like, oh my gosh, like this, I have to go deeper into this. So you really created a beautiful doorway for the exploration to even happen. Thank, Thank you, you for that. Yeah. We're not afraid of color as, as you aren't afraid of color either. And I saw last time we, when we were together that you had a little rainbow palette of flower essences, which I thought was so adorable. Yes. And so when you are painting, for example, do you just mix in the elixirs with the paints as you're, and then like I drink do. it and put it on the I do all the above. So I know that you've got the anointing oils and you've also got the, the kind that you ingest, like you put under your tongue. Uh -huh. So I will, um, depending on kind of what I'm working with, I'll put it under my tongue. Sometimes I'll put that stuff in the paint too, but I typically use the the anointing oils more in the oh, paint. Cool. And then, oh, yeah, so I've been so it's kind of playing with it, mixing it up. I mean, wow. sort of intuitive. Yeah, and also in my space where I work, I kind of do the four directions. Okay. And I with with those the flower essences and I use other essential oils too for that uh -huh. but I, I yeah weaving in elements of nature and then of course I use water from local waterfalls in my art as well so it's like I'm always looking for it, you know it kind of goes back to childhood we're sort of coming full circle in our conversation we started with going back to childhood mm -hmm. and and how that kind of sets us up for life and for me in my art being in nature was always the connection to home. It was always the place where I felt safe. It was always the place where my imagination was free to unfold. Right. And so in my art today, I find ways to bring nature into the art to really show that that is my partner in this. You That's know, it's so like sweet. nature is a partner for me. I yeah. love that. That's so sweet. And I know that you've said that one of your main goal is such a funny word, but your main intentions in this life is to have a global impact through your work. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the impact you've had thus far, where you're going with it, and a little about Soul Art Day and how that ties in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So being someone who started out very much like more of a loner type, it was surprising for me to feel the call that I am to share on a bigger stage. You know, it's like, I am, I spend a lot of time alone. I, I do a lot of things that are public in terms of putting out my work, but I myself, when I'm working, it's very much alone unless I have a team for a photo shoot. But when I got the message and the, the sense, it's like, no, this work is like a portal. Like I feel like my art and my creations, my insights and vision are a portal for people to remember who they really are. And it, I just, I heard so clearly, like it has to be available for people, it has to be out there. And I feel like the people that I will have an impact on or an influence or inspiration, it's like that'll ripple out. And I feel like that's the global impact. It's like reaching people on a soul level, touching them on a soul level, and then they shift something. Right. And because they shift something, that ripples out to like another thousand people exactly. um, that are impacted by that. So where I am now is I feel like I've done a lot of things and done a lot of online projects like International Soul Art Day is one of them. This will be our seventh or eighth year. And um, thousands of people participate in these online events that I host. And I love it. They're amazing. And I just feel like I'm preparing myself almost on like muscles, like toning my muscles, my soul <laughs> muscles to be able to open to more you know, like that, that can reach more people. So it's just the, the growth and the expansion of what I'm doing. Well, just you're already take- reaching a ton of people, right? With International mm-hmm. Solar Day. Yeah. International Solar Day is so, oh my gosh, it's so amazing. And like, and when I did it the first year, this is me kind of like coming out of like, I'm just learning about business, you know, I'm like, oh, I guess I could do a workshop online. I thought maybe a couple hundred people will come and like thousands of people, like they just, it was just like, oh my goodness, this wow. is so exciting. And also energetically, I had to work my energy because it kind of knocked me out mm-hmm. that first year. Like, whoa, I to to be visible to thousands of people. There's an energetics to that, and mm-hmm. I have I'm learning it, and I'm learning how to increase that capacity of that. Mm-hmm. So that's where I'm at now, and it's sort of toning and tuning my my system so that my work is able to reach more and more people. And what practices are you doing to enhance your capacity to hold things energetically? Mm -hmm. I think the biggest thing that I'm doing, I mean, there's many things. The biggest thing is kind of like my own energy awareness and being able to Like in any given day, there's things that trigger me. There's things I feel so constricted, so frustrated. And then there's things that really enliven me. And the way that I'm working on increasing my capacity is being in those moments when I'm enlivened and celebrating it and letting that, you know, become normal. But also in the moments when I'm frustrated and like annoyed and so overwhelmed, being able to start to bring in just even little by little, just more ease into it because then it increases my capacity for more of the ease. So it's like those things come up and irritation comes up and I'm like, here's my next initiation and I'm so annoyed. I don't even want it, (laughs) but there it is. Something will happen. And then I'm like, how can, can I show up for this? How can I bring more of who I really am to this thing that I don't like? And And then I kind of increase my capacity because then Mm -hmm. I'm no longer afraid of that experience. I'm like, okay, I can live in that too. And then there's another thing. And it's like, oh, can I, how can I live in this thing too? Meaning how can I be myself in this thing? Because it's easy when we have our natural things Mm -hmm. that were easy for us to show up in. Like if I'm doing my art, I'm fully present. I'm like totally me. It's easy. Right. But like have someone cut me off in traffic and I'm late and I'm like, you know, and then like (laughs) you get a flat tire and then you have no gas. I mean, like that, (laughs) that's where my work is. Right. Right. (laughs) That's where I bring in the the more capacity. And then that expands into it reflects into other things too, because you just generally have more capacity. Right. And so this year, International Soul Art Day is when and how can people join and what should they expect? Mm-hmm. So International Soul Art Day is on May 23rd. So it's a live day. And what it means is that 
people gather online to create art together for the day. And it's all experiences. Some people who are afraid of drawing a stick figure and there's people who are like master level artists. So the, the skill level isn't, you know, it's no barrier. It's like you come in and I guide a journey. It's a free thing. People can sign up at soulartday.com or go to loraholic.com and you can get it from there. And you'll get a free guided journey. And then you get to watch me and other artists in the studio we're working throughout the day. And then there's a beautiful mm -hmm. Facebook group and people can connect. And so there's this one live day that has a really potent vortex of mm -hmm. creativity. And then there's also kind of the month surrounding it that really we're supporting the community of integrating the art that flowed through from that day. So this year we're using the flower essences in our process, on, like in the studio. So the artists that I'm creating with in the studio, we're using flower essences in that. And also, of course, I invite and encourage people who are, you know, anywhere in the world to do it too, to amplify the the process and bring in that natural element so that nature is supporting your creativity. Nature is part of the process. And then when you want to manifest your visions, nature also can support you in that. Yeah. So I'm so excited. Yeah. May 23rd is the big day. That's so exciting. I'm so excited you're bringing flower essences into that too. So mm -hmm. again, for people, for listeners out there who want to know more about that, that's soulartday.com or you can go to Laura's website at lauraholic.com. And just to wrap up, is there any last little piece of advice, wisdom, or something that you often find yourself telling people, sort of a distillation of, of a mm -hmm. meaningful thing right now? Yeah. Well, the thing that I feel kind of allows us to connect with our own flowering is asking the question, you know, if you could really be or do anything you wanted, who, who would you be? And I feel like that exposes the truth of our flower, like who we are, what is our soul flower? What's our soul, the garden that, you know, that wants to grow us. It's like allowing ourselves to hear what our desires are like if we really if there were no barriers to who you could be what would that feel like what would that look like and who are you and I feel like that gives kind of a a guidance a, a navigation for like some people are like oh I would be you know they have their list of things and it's like okay there's your list but what would that feel like what would that what would you experience if you were that being that expression and it just becomes a guide. So I feel like whenever I'm working with people, I'm always, I want to understand that. Like, who are you really? What is your true calling, your true desire? And then that will reveal the map to the realization. But it's like, that's the seed of it. Mm -hmm. and, and then it's like, from there, you get the steps of what to do with it. But it's like getting that vision. And really, that's what Soul Art Day is. It's like a day to get your vision to access your vision and to allow it to like to see it so that you have a manifestation tool, you have a guidance system, you have something magnetically pulling you to what you want. So that a simple question just if you could be or do anything, you know, who would you be? And oh. letting that start to inform you on the seed of your potential. I love that. So let's all join Laura for International Soul Art Day. I love that as a tool for manifestation and creating the life that you want to live. Thank you so much, Laura, for being with us. Thank you. And for those of you who live in the New York area, just a reminder that we have a flower flash mob coming up at the end of May, and we'll post the secret location on Instagram. And if you're in the Chicago area, we have another flower lounge and flower flash mob coming up in Chicago on June 15th and 16th. Again, thanks for listening to the flower lounge. Thank you so much for listening to The Flower Lounge. I'm Katie Hess, and we'll be releasing a new podcast every Wednesday. If you like what you heard or you know someone who might be touched by our conversation, share it with them. And don't forget to subscribe. To find out what your favorite flowers mean about you, take the quiz at lotusway.com.